Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we have an awesome show for you. We're talking about things you didn't know about Pope St. John Paul II. <laughs> yeah, there's some very interesting facts like his personal nicknames, his girlfriend when he was young, some of the secret activities that he had, and things that you just never would have thought John Paul II had done. JP2, we, we love you. JP2, we love you. <laughs> Studio with Brian Shield and Father Rich Pagano. It's good to be here with you. Great to be here in beautiful Southern California, Cast Media Studios, right off of Sunset Boulevard. It's gorgeous. All right, right in the middle of Hollywood. Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> Hollywood. Uh, Hollywood. Weird. <laughs> we got a cool show. I love John Paul. Yeah, II. me too, man. JP2. Really I'm so honored that one, I was ordained on the day of his birth. So May 18th. Wow, wow, you don't you don't look hardly that old. Yeah, it was like nineteen. <laughs> I was, uh, ni- I've been 1930s. a priest for one hundred and twenty six years. You got to remember where I'm a priest. Though I'm a priest in Mission Nombre de Dios, uh, where the Fountain of Youth is. Ah, that's right. So hey, man, I could stick around for a little bit. I you don't look 25. a day. Of, you don't look a day over one hundred and thirty two. <laughs> You're the best, man. Thank it's you. the wrinkles. It is, and it's the creams. Yes. Anti aging. Yeah, the anti aging cream. L'Oreal. You look good. No, oh, thank you. Maybe he's born with it. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe it's Maybelline. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> Goodness me. So no, this is this is a really cool episode. Obviously, JP2 is a huge influencer uh, in and around the world in politics and theology and philosophy as an academic, but also World Youth Day, theology of the body. I mean, this guy had it all and he has one of the most impressive deposits of ministry as a pope and certainly has been very influential in our own individual lives yeah, as well. Yeah, he's like my pope yeah. growing up. And I know? think he'll be our pope for, for our lives. Yeah, yeah I, I think, you know, it's only been 15 or so years since he's passed, but I don't think that we've even come close to scratching the surface on the impact that he has had and that he will continue to have. He really is one of the lines of history. And um, as as time goes on, unpacking his legacy, unpacking his work, I think is going to have just a continued fundamental impact on Western society and and the world. And before we unpack that, especially even unpacking this in our episode today about JP2, we want you to get on that computer and subscribe going to the website, catholictalkshow.com. And we've got all these wonderful ways that you can listen to us or watch us, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, and make sure that you're following us on social media. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We're continuing to build our traction in all of these different social media angles, and we want you to be a part of every second of what we're doing as the Catholic Talk Show. So make sure you're there. And guys, we really need your help. So please consider being a patron and go to our website for our Patreon app, which is Ryan Shield. Patreon.com forward slash Catholic Talk Show. Do it. Uh, you can go Do there. It. You can see opportunities to help support the show to ensure that we can continue making the this uh, program and that you can also get opportunities to get uh, exclusive content, really cool things like coffee mugs and cool hoodies and man. hats and all kinds of... These are really comfortable hoodies, by yeah, the way. All, they are. all kinds of mega dope Catholic talk show um, swag. Mega swag. Right. Mega. Catholic swag. All right. So let's get into John Paul II's uh, life and some of the things that people probably didn't know about him. So... When you think of a pope, you really typically don't think of their baptismal name. You think of their their uh, pontifical name, and and John Paul II is a, it's iconic. That it's JP two, um, but do you know his real name? What his name was? Carol. Carol. Yeah, for Carol. Charles, it was like a derivative of Charles, like an well, English yeah. version of Charles. Yeah, it's Carol. Carol Joseph Wotia. Yeah. Carol Joe. Yeah, Charlie Joe. Charlie hey, yo, Joe. Charlie Joe. Yeah, Carol. Like if you think of. Charlemagne, mm-hmm. uh, he would have been Carol. Mm-hmm. So it's really Carol is Charles, but Carol he is really the like a Charlemagne mm-hmm. type name. And it's not Carol with a C, people. It's Karov. It's, it's with a K. K. That's right. Yeah. Um, so because of that, it is, like you said, basically a form of Charles. That's the Polish version of Charles. Um, and he was named after his dad, so mm-hmm. he's like technically a junior because it's... It's the same exact middle name. That's right. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Joseph. But do you know what Carol his nickname Joseph. was growing Lolek. up? Lolek. That's right. 
low neck. Yeah. Like Charlie, like a, like, you know, a Chucky, little Chucky, Chucky. No, let's that. not say Chucky. Cause then I think of <laughs> Chucky <laughs> and sliced up, you know, Achilles while JP two is writing love and responsibility, <laughs> Chucky's doing something damage. very, very differently. He's doing damage. <laughs> yeah. He's doing damage. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to think of this revered, uh, this this saintly pope, and then think of him as you know just a kid where people are like, hey Chuck, hey Charlie, come over here and let's play soccer, you know. So thinking of him and and knowing that people called him low lack, which is like you know a very diminutive form and a very familiar form of like Charlie, it, it's really pretty cool. It is, and I could I've I've been so privileged to walk around Wadowice in Poland, where he grew up as a kid, Vodavice. and his house man is right behind the church. And he was an altar server, and I prayed right next to where his baptismal font is. And, um, you know, he would pray at that baptismal font, remembering his baptism, even as an adolescent. And then he, as a pope, he came back and prayed at that baptismal font as well. It was a constant source of contact with where the springs of salvation really transformed his life. So he that's was amazing. always meditating on that. Yeah, and then that's basically where he grew up is a essentially a suburb of Krakow, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. And so you can fly into you can fly into Krakow and then you're in Vadovice and you know less than two hours. I mean it's it's not that far of a drive. Oh, that's oh well, no, that's yeah. not that bad. Yeah. Now, in that area where he grew up, there was a very there was a very mixed community between ethnic Poles and ethnic uh, Jewish Poles. Mm -hmm. So it was a very mixed neighborhood, and there was a lot of Polish uh, kids growing up around him. And uh, he was all growing up, according to all accounts, very. Um, I would say ecumenical. He, he, a lot of people had a lot of prejudice against the Jews of Poland, uh, but he was not one of them. Uh, there's even one story that when he was young, he was they would play soccer every day. And typically it was the Jewish kids versus the Catholic kids. But there was more Catholic kids than Jewish kids, so the Jewish team was undermanned. And he would always um, he would volunteer to play goalie for the Jewish team. Mm -hmm. It was a very early form of his what would later spring out as his ecumenism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his ecumenism is truly inspiring. And you could see that early on in his childhood. And I could imagine seeing that type of division on the on the field of sport with soccer, or, you know, as, mm -hmm. you, as you call it, football, is, is important to see. And it was also his perception of what sports can do sociologically and how it can break down barriers. Mm -hmm. You could see his greater teachings as it relates to yeah. sports and sociology that is just so profound and something that I truly loved reading when I was 20, 21, 22. Heck, I still like, yeah. I still like reading that material. You know, you could see where it was spawned from. It was his own athletic ability on the field of sport and realizing, wow, this can really do something pretty impressively. And, and we could start to dissolve some of these uh, natural boundaries to one another. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So in that vein, um, like you're a priest, you have a vow of celibacy. celibacy. Mm -hmm. Um, but it wasn't always that case. You've, you've had girlfriends, right? Oh, I definitely have. I've had quite a few, you know, growing up. And But John Paul II's first love, you was. know, with a woman was the Blessed Virgin Mary. Wow. <laughs> you know, he was consecrated. After his mother died, he was consecrated wow. to the Blessed Virgin Mary in a local town there. And I visited and, and prayed before the icon that he was... Uh, consecrated to her. So that was the first Jewish girl that he truly fell in love with and consecrated uh -huh. his life with. But there was another Jewish girl, That's right. right? Now, John Paul, now you probably, most of you out there probably have not heard this or don't know this, but John Paul II, his first and really his only serious girlfriend was a young Jewish girl. Hmm. He dated a young Jewish girl, and I love her name, Ginka Beer. Ginka yeah, Beer. Ginka Beer. <laughs> Ginka Beer. <laughs> Which I think is a microbrew out of Portland. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, um... John Paul described her in his later writings as a Jewish beauty with stupendous eyes and jet black hair, slender and a superb actress. Yes. Yeah, he liked that. Sounds too. pretty sounds oh, pretty yeah. enamored with her. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. And I and I've speaking I've spoken to so many priests who obviously have had you yeah. know romantic relationships and um it's healthy. It's very healthy. It's very you normal. Know? Yeah. Yeah. And I I think that still having a fondness for them. It's not something that uh, has to be completely stricken from the heart. Um, it's something that a lot of priests carry with them and can carry with them the proper fondness for that, that former relationship. Oh my goodness. I don't know where I would be if I didn't have that. It, it's, it's almost necessary. I think it's almost essential for in, in, somebody who is in formation to be a priest to have human love, mm -hmm, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, experience with, 
another, you mm-hmm. know, um, another woman. And what kind of experience are you talking well, about? Right? Friendship, <laughs> courtship, you know, yeah. even uh, romantic infatuation. I mean, that's yeah, yeah that's crushes, you know, like that kind of stuff is very important because you're giving that up for mm-hmm. the, the greater good. Yeah, and, and having that proper exploration of those feelings right. um, is, I think, proper to discernment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just, because if you don't have them, eventually they're going to crop up right. and you're going to have to deal with that sooner or later. Yeah, yeah. It, it was funny. There, a priest friend of mine, he's an older priest now. You know, he's, he's well into his 60s, nearing his 70s. And he's just one of the most active priests I know. He's out and about and he's doing yeah. all sorts of stuff everywhere, just serving. And he's, he's been such an example of priesthood and a great support to me as a young guy. But he got a text message from, you know, women like his junior by maybe 20, 30 years. Right. And he knows these he knows these girls from the time that he did, you know, youth ministry yeah. with them years ago. And they message him because they take care of him, take care of him left and right. You know, and from your three wives, you know, and, and it was a picture of them and they were smiling. And so it was cute. real. It was a real cute message. But it's true. And I think I think of, you know, women in my life, the women of the church, man, if I didn't have that feminine presence in my life, you know, calling me to the greater deposit of my ministry as as a priest, as a celibate and that tenderness and that femininity, you know, in my life, it, it's it's what truly consoles me in the midst of the, the toils of my life. And certainly, you know, I think of I think of the uh, Kankowski, you know, family clan. down in the Kankowski clan down in San Diego and how much they were a support to me. And um, you know, and, and taking care of me, you know, it was just, it was just a tremendous gift. So for sure. And, and having that in a balanced way and having that in your life, I think only promotes greater health of vocation for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And JP two always had that. And he had, he had very, very close relationships, not only with this, this Jewish girl, this actress, but also with women throughout his life yeah. mm-hmm. that he was very, very close to with and proper wrote- boundaries, but then, but, but also fully taking advantage of the, the feminine genius. Yes. Yeah. And he wrote uh, amazing books on love. Oh, yeah. You know, and poetry, a lot of poetry. It's like, you know, some of the the greatest books on how to of love and what the meaning is and fulfillment in that is coming from somebody who's a celibate. Have you yeah. guys ever, it's, I know it's so true. It's amazing. Well, and I, I, th- I look at my life guys and it's, I'm constantly doing marriage prep, marriage counseling, yeah. marriage ministry, and it's every day for me. And it's such a wonderful privilege because I get to learn so much about the complementarity and the difference between man and woman drawn yeah. together in a special sacrament and called to this unity, you know, and, and called to be one. It's, it's a process, man. It's, it's a pilgrimage in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. And I get to look at that and analyze it and study it, learning, gleaning from each individual couple and then being able to share that. And I've been doing that for 17 years. Yeah. yeah. You see so many times people say, well, what does a priest know about marriage or love? He's celibate. Well, I don't know. What does an oncologist know about cancer? He's never had cancer. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've studied this day in and day out. You've studied this in seminary. You've studied in real world application. You deal with this every day. I mean, I would dare say that you are the subject matter on mm-hmm. it. And I think that's very common with the, the priesthood. So uh, yeah. and with John Paul too, I think that was eminently apparent with him. Without a doubt. Yeah. His work with couples in the, and when he was working in the college for a while and, and uh, you know, I could just picture him up in the mountains when they were calling him uncle because of communist reign, you yeah. know, like he, he was, he was taking care of a lot of couples and really guiding them in preparation for marriage for sure. I know that. So here's a couple other things you probably didn't know about him is that, You've seen the Terminator, right? Oh yeah, Love where they go back movie. in time and they're just trying to kill John Connor because <laughs> yeah. he's going to come up and change the world. Yeah, I feel like there might be some sort of that going on with John Paul II because there are so many times he almost died. Oh yeah, really? and oh absolutely, I think there was hell was out to get him, and mm. he he persevered with the help of Our Lady. But um, when he was 15 years old, uh, a friend of his they're they're you know horsing around with guns and he pointed it at you know, Lolek and accidentally the gun went off and I mean, it was point blank and they were, and they're like, I don't know how that missed you. That it was, they like, it's like essentially it went through you. Playing with guns. Not a good Don't play with guns, guys. Gun safety. Yeah. Hello. If there's kids listening to this, (laughs) don't play with guns, all right? Get proper gun training. Get with the program. Owning a gun goes along with proper education. Don't play with guns, kids. (laughs) It's not a good idea. Hey, this is Uncle Ryan. You don't go playing with those guns. (laughs) 
<laughs> so yeah, so that was one time that he almost died. Did he uh, got hit by the bus? Well, right? he got hit by a Nazi truck. <laughs> a Nazi truck. What? Isn't that crazy? Yeah, he's walking down the road coming home from JP2's work. I love JP2's life. Bro. During the Nazi occupation of Poland, and a Nazi truck blasted him. Yeah. Knocked him unconscious. He's lying half dead in the ditches. And they picked him up and... <laughs> In the ditches. In the yeah. ditches. Yeah, they did. Because that's where you lie after, these, that after you get hit by a Nazi truck. Well, these stupid Nazis hit him and they just keep going. And there's Kara Rotia dying in a ditch after getting crushed by a Nazi truck. <clears throat> Someone comes along, finds him, takes him to the hospital, and he and he makes it. It's so crazy. And he was like on their hit list, the communists. I yeah. mean, like, he was, he's been on a number of people's lists. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. He's so, had a crazy life. But that experience really helped him to say, yeah. Yes, I think it is time for me to really consider my vocation and really make that jump into discernment for the priesthood. Yeah. So, which a lot of people did back mm -hmm. then. Yeah, Poland, a lot of people sure. got hit by Nazi buses and trucks and, and immediately decided to become priests. Priest. <laughs> Yeah, during that time, that was actually the ordination process. It was a vocational. Yeah, you got to get run over by a bus. The yeah. vocation office, that was their plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> get a Nazi truck, run over some people, men. Priests, boom. It's and brilliant. Then, boom. Boom. You hear that, kids? So, <laughs> don't you go hopping out. Don't in front run in traffic. <laughs> <laughs> Have some gun safety and don't run into traffic. Okay, we're covering so then a lot after of that. Another thing, a lot probably, of ground. probably another thing you didn't know about that is that he had to join an underground seminary because you were not allowed in Nazi occupied Poland to be in seminary. Yep. So he was in an underground seminary and he got his priestly training there. Now, when the Allies were liberating, well, actually, it wouldn't have been the Allies. When his, when the Nazis were leaving because the Soviets were Coming. pushing them out, the the seminarians who were underground had went and they're like, okay, the Nazis are out of town. Let's go reclaim the seminary like that day because it had been occupied. Well, it was in a, it was in bad shape, and this is something that you don't know, is that it was freezing there, and all the pipes had busted, and the whole large areas of the seminary was were covered in frozen excrement. Oh, wow. Gross. So there was a handful of seminarians, and Ew. John Paul volunteered to take an axe and a shovel, break up these giant mounds of hmm. poops. poops. Dung heap. Break them up with an axe, shovel them out, and carry them away. That was his job to get the seminary back together. Bro, we need JP2 back, man. He needs to clean up the poop. <laughs> He, I mean, he cleaned up a lot of poop in his day. He did. Literally. He did. Yeah, I know. And figuratively. Yeah, and figuratively. Right. Yeah. No, you know, it's crazy how many times, I mean, think of how much he's traveled and, you know, the, the potentials of him being hurt or killed or murdered, the time he got shot, the time he almost got stabbed, right? Like there's so many moments in John Paul II's life where he was he was placed in a situation. So, yeah, that's another thing that we we're going to talk about, that a thing that you didn't know about. Now, most people know that, that uh, Pope St. John Paul II was shot by a gunman in Vatican, uh, in St. Peter's Square, and survived. Yeah. What a lot of people don't know or don't recall was that there was a second assassin assassination attempt on him while he was in, uh, in during his pontificate. And, and it was from, this time, not a kind of you know, Looney Tune character. This was from a, okay, let me roll that back. He was from, a, he was, he was pretty nuts, but he was actually an SSPX priest. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Now he was a little Lulu, little Lulu. But they kept, they kept that under wraps though for years, right? Yeah. Well, no, no, they kept under, they kept under wraps the fact that, so this SSP that he was priest. an SSPX priest. They kept the well. See, there was debate as to whether or not. So the SSPX said that he had been dismissed from the order two years prior. Other people say no. That was he was only dismissed after attacking the Pope. Well, this priest, um, the Spanish SSPX priest, had a bayonet, a gun with a bayonet, uh, and and That's tried bizarre. to attack the Pope, tried to kill him. It's like you know, death to modernists or whatever. And they never talked about it, but years later, the Pope's personal secretary said, when we got back to the hotel that night, the Pope was bleeding. He had been stabbed. Um, and most people don't know that there was that second, very Did close not. assassination attempt. Dude, JP2 is the OG, man. Yeah. JP2 is Batman. The D in the DC <laughs> so seminary, awesome. they actually have some of the clothes that he was wearing when he was shot. Yeah, like, I've seen that. Yeah. You've seen it? Yeah, man. Another thing, too, I don't know if we're going to mention, but he, he wanted to be a monk. I didn't know that. He mm -hmm. he wanted to, yeah, he he went to the monastery and was like, 
I want to do this thing. And they're like, they discerned him out mm. a lot like me. Yeah, you're just, just like not him. Like him, but you he, never thought of monkhood. They never took me. <laughs> you back didn't think in. of becoming a monk. <laughs> monk history. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I I, I think that's well documented. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he was he was torn by it, really upset. Mm-hmm. So here's another thing you didn't know about Pope Saint John Paul II, is that according to some people, now part of this is absolutely 100 percent confirmed, and the other part is uh, maybe apocryphal, maybe true. He actually went to the confession of, he went to confession and his confessor was St. Padre Pio. And according to some, Padre Pio during the confession said, um, basically prophesied that he would become the Pope one day. And this was in 1960s. And Padre Pio prophesied that something along the lines of, now I've given confession to the Pope. And you know that that story, a lot of that is legend. Mm-hmm. But um, but I actually, always but him going and getting confession from Padre Pio mm-hmm. is a fact. You no, know, he he actually he did pilgrimage down to mm-hmm. visit Padre Pio without a doubt. That's right. Um, but yeah, like the whole prophecy of becoming pope, I wouldn't put it past Padre Pio though. No, either would I. <laughs> you know, it's uh, you know I put nothing past that miracle worker of yeah, a of a Saint Padre Pio. He's got well documented. Oh my goodness things, gracious, you know. he's amazing. So you guys have both talked about him going on pilgrimage and how much he traveled. So do you know how much he actually traveled? My goodness, he's probably traveled. Oh my gosh, millions of miles. So it's it's. I think we can all agree that going to the moon is a pretty far trip. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's probably how much he traveled. He went to the moon and back three times. Wow, that's a wow. lot of travel. Mm-hmm. That's essentially going around the the equator of the earth 30 times. Yeah, he was the most traveled pope in the history right. of, of the church. They're still using his frequent flyer miles <laughs> at the Vatican. They right are. Now. Oh, yeah, man, I'm that would sure. be wonderful. Yeah. It's just successive <laughs> to each. Just, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, when Pope Francis is scheduling one of his uh, ecumenical trips, they're just like, well, let's, let's pay for it with miles. What Stay do they call them. that in the de- in Delta? It's like a, the diamond... Delta number? Elite Reward. Delta Elite, something. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's got a whole nother classification. <laughs> So uh, here's a little bit of John Paul by the numbers. He was, his pontificate lasted 9,965 days and he visited 129 countries traveling 1,247,613 kilometers or 750 miles, which again is the equivalent 750, of 750,000 miles. Yeah. miles, which is the equivalent of going around the equator 30 times. <laughs> Oof, so crazy. Yeah. That's so crazy. Wow. Now here's a little bit more of the numbers. Now he was a polyglot. Right, and mm-hmm. that means that he spoke many languages. languages, thirteen languages. He spoke nine, nine, and and he fluently, he, yeah, fluently. He expressed himself in probably like tons, tons of languages. It must have been like sixty he languages studied, or something. He well, studied so he, like the hermeneutics of language mm-hmm. in, in his in his training. Yeah, he spoke Polish, Latin, ancient Greek, French, German, English, Spanish, Portuguese, and some Russian. One Easter, he gave a blessing. It's, he gave the Easter blessing in 64 different languages. <laughs> 64 that languages. Tagalog, Japanese, Chinese. I mean, he he expressed himself in so many different pig languages. Latin. That is a pig Latin. pig Latin. That was the one that gave Pope Esperanto. John Paul II the most amount of difficulty was really mastering the pig Latin language. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's tough. It is. It's really tough. And in these travels, there's another thing you might not know. And this is a really, I think this is a cool fact. Because of these travels, he became the most seen person in the history of mankind. Mm-hmm. More people have physically seen John Paul II than anyone else in history. Over 550 million individuals have personally seen Pope John Paul II. And then, like, you count the World Youth Day where there was well, like in the Philippines. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. It was the largest gather, human gathering yeah, like in history. In people. history. Yeah, that's four million right there. No, it was. It, I think it was between like five to seven million people what was in it that for? gathering. It was, it was for, for World Youth Day in it Philippines. It was like one of the first ones. Yeah, yeah it was for like a Eucharistic. Uh, oh yeah, it was like an event Euc- during World Youth Day. Maybe it was during. I, I, something maybe, like that. Yeah, it was something like that. I thought I was always under the impression it was World Youth Day, but um, that was the largest gathering. The in largest human history. gathering in yeah. human history. That's pretty powerful. Yeah. And I'm so glad that it happened in the Philippines. I just, I grew up with Filipino Catholics in Palm Coast. Oh, yeah. And I mean, just the fact, every time I walked into any of my friend's house, I always expected lumpia, 
and the rosary and then karaoke. And it was just such a Catholic experience, dude. I absolutely loved growing up with the Filipino community in PC. Shout out to all my boys out there. We used to play hoops all day, come in sweaty, nasty. And mom Flores would be like making us food. And oh, dude, it was the best stuff. All stuff. right. So here, here's another fact that you probably didn't know about John Paul II. He canonized more saints than any pope Without in history. Doubt. Part of it was because his pontificate was very long, mm -hmm. I think. I th it was yeah. the second or third longest pontificate. Yeah, mm -hmm. But he also, was... so he had a really good, really, a really good quip on that, that someone was criticizing. They're like, you know, we had in all of the history of the church up until your pontificate, we had 10,000 canonized saints who went through the process. And we've doubled that during your pontificate. He said, don't take it up with me. Take it up with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> I loved his sense of humor. <laughs> so he celebrated... 1,338 beatifications, including 1,032 martyrs, and he canonized 482 saints, including Jeez. 402 martyrs. Now, it's not like he was just willy-nilly about canonizations, but the, the, the level of martyrdoms in the world in the, in the 200 years prior to his pontificate really did lend itself to that level of amount of canonizations because martyrs, obviously, yeah. you know, go... Uh, but that that's a uh, testament to the persecution of the church in the world, but also to his sensitivity and understanding of all these conflict zones and all the, the witnesses and martyrs of the faith who experienced them. Mm -hmm. He was not afraid. You know, that thing that he always said, be not afraid. Yeah. He continued to canonize and affirm the faith of so many different countries in and around the world. And he evaluated and really supported the canonization process and beatification process of so many people. And think about what that does to a community. You know, we're, we're not Mexican, you know, but we've, we've been talking about the canonization of Cachita Cabrera, somebody that we feel very, very close to. And her tomb is in Mexico City. And the excitement that I have, because I love Our Lady of Guadalupe, I love the Cristeros, I love the culture and the faith of the Mexican people so much that I, I feel equally enthusiastic about this canonization. And what does that say from Rome, the eternal city, you know, at the, at the seat of Peter, you know, the vicar of Christ, that this is being affirmed? And what does that do to a people? What does that do to a country? How does that amplify the faith? Well, JP2 was a doctor in that, he man. He was an that. expert yeah. in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then he was like one of the first uh, popes in a long time that wasn't Italian too, right? Yeah, since the 16th century. That yeah, first pope in yeah. 400 years. Uh, huh. yeah. The last pope before him that was not Italian was a Dutch pope in the, in the 1600s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's pretty amazing. First thing. Polish pope. Mm -hmm. And then you had a German one, and then mm -hmm. you had a, you know, I mean, so you- Argentinian. Argentinian yeah. Italian. My money is uh, that the next pope is going to be Italian. Mm -hmm. I think they're like, well, okay, that, that was nice. That's, that's enough. Yeah, that's that's enough. enough. You guys got your turn. <laughs> Bring it back in. Bring it back here you had to, your fun. to you the had boot. Your fun. <laughs> Bring it back to the boot. Bring it back to the Bring boot. Bring it back to the boot. <laughs> now, one last thing that I want to talk about, a thing that you probably don't know about, and maybe you do, and if you don't, that's fine too. So when a saint is canonized, what are the typical um, requirements for the canonization of a person? One, they're a martyr. Two, they have miracles. two miracles. Mm -hmm. So well, do you know what the two miracles that led to Pope mm. St. John Paul's no. canonization? I don't. One, the first one that made him a beati, a blessed, was the remission of Parkinson's in a French nun. Now, mm -hmm. John Paul II suffered from Parkinson's. You could see it in his later oh, years. He yeah, had, he had, that's right. Had yeah. A lot of... He had, he, he it's suffered very from. obvious. It's very obvious. And he suffered heroically Almost with a it. decade. Right. Maybe more. Well, a, a French nun, um, just very shortly after his death, prayed to John Paul II, and her Parkinson's was completely alleviated, alleviated and gone. Wow. And that was completely backed up. So That's great. That, that was the first out. miracle. Now, the second miracle, the one that led to him being canonized, was to a, a Costa Rican woman named Flor Beth. So she had, uh, she had a condition. Um, brain aneurysm. Brain aneurysm, right. That was, Dr. Sedar, is inoperable and you are going to die from it. And there's nothing that can be done. We can't do anything. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so she was basically just dribbling out the clock, waiting to die. And she was at home in bed, bread, bread ridden, couldn't really do anything. And she was reading a magazine. And on the cover was John Paul II. And, on the, and the, the image of John Paul II on the cover spoke to her. And said, Flora Beth, what are you doing in bed? Why aren't you in the ki- why don't you get up and go into the kitchen and see your husband? Whoa. That's, that's crazy. excellent, dude. And then she said that from the image, the Pope's hands seemed to reach out to her in mm. a loving way. And she responded, she said, Okay, I will. I feel fine right now. And she got up, went into the kitchen, talked to her husband, and that was it. She was she was healed. She said, I, I felt a great sense of wellness inside of me. And from that day, I was completely healed. Now, people are like, well, okay, this is, this is crazy, right? That, that, that Most. stuff doesn't happen. So what they did is when this word got to the religious superiors that would have been in charge of the area, they arranged for her to go to Rome, to a hospital, under the guise of her being a Costa Rican tourist who was happening to visit the Vatican, but then had symptoms of a brain aneurysm. So they checked her into a hospital with a false story and a false name so that the doctors there would have complete um, arbitrary uh, an examination of her and not be looking at her. And this was all done very clandestine. It's like, no, man, we don't, we don't see any activity of brain aneurysm. There's nothing here. You're good to go home. Yeah. Is that awesome? Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And she was, give, she was at the canonization of uh, Pope St. John Paul II. Yeah, so beautiful Flora Beth story. from Costa Rica. You know, Shout out. Beautiful story. Speaking of Parkinson's and John Paul II's uh, ailment, my grandfather had Parkinson's, and and I got to witness that for you know the t- twelve years that he had it, and then Alzheimer's dementia. And I just think of JP two. You know, next to my grandfather, you know, he's the greatest role model for me, and I just deeply care about him and love him very much. And um, people have asked me because I've given a lot of testimonies about my relationship with JP two over the years, and. I've shared a lot with, especially with young people, but they've asked, you know, what is your favorite thing that JP2 has ever said? And what's your favorite quote or what's your favorite book that he's ever written and, and all of these different things. And I always say it was his last address to the people and he showed a dignity to the process of dying. So did my grandfather. Mm-hmm. And it was a slow, it was a slow death. It was a painful death. And it was a heroic death though too. But then that's the, that's the whole idea is that, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't shy away from the natural process of death because there's something very, very heroic. And the same words of JP 2s motto, be not afraid, you know, it, it digs down into the deep, deepest roots of our human fear of the unknown that is the veil of death. And, you know, he spoke so eloquently of that when he was willing to get up on that microphone after being traked. He was very intentional about that. He was very intentional with allowing his suffering and his his dying and his slow death being very public and being very aware to people because he was using it as a teaching and an instructive moment. So So catechetical. And then when he stood up there and mustered as much strength as he possibly could. I remember that. After being traked. And I've, I've had that experience of how raw your throat is. But on top Mm. of that, you know, he's got Parkinson's, his muscles are failing. He's dying years of that. And then he gets up and he just, nobody knows what he says, but he murmurs and the communication of love that he expressed to everybody there that had journeyed so far to be with him in his last days. You know, that, I mean, man, that made me, that, for that such, was a handkerchief moment for in my such life. A power, <laughs> for such a powerful communicator and someone who was so articulate and such a, a philosopher and a, and a poet. Brilliant, man. And he'd written so much that one of his most powerful communications was so feeble and so barely there, and it still was able to be incredibly powerful, showed he understood communication at a deeper level than just words, but really as the, 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 the uh, union between two people exchanging awareness. And that's, that is a very powerful lesson. And that's a lasting word that will reverberate through history. And in me, that has left the greatest impact is that address more so than any others. And I was so privileged. I got to actually be there, receive a blessing from JP2 and be at one of his audiences, but it it doesn't even hold a candle to that, to that expression of love and shepherding. And it was, it was a very uh, fatherly, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, expression. Another thing too, is he had a photographic memory. So he would, he would meet people and then 
10, 12 years would see the same people again in a random audience and say, hey, Bob, how are you doing? That's an amazing. <laughs> I, mean, I pray for that gift, man. Like, I am like the complete opposite. I, I'm the exact opposite. I, I like somebody tell, looks me in the eye, tells me their name, and then I forget. It's out of like, my head. Yeah. Yeah. And and I'll I'll remember faces. I'll remember experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll remember like, no, I, I know that I've, I've met, met you. this person. Yeah. But, oh, man, I wish but I had that. But that just shows gift. the care that he had for people, oh. that, the, how he valued all the every oh, person. Yeah, yeah. It, there, I think he was an extraordinary person yeah. in that regard. Me, I just really don't care. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's yeah. not true. I really do. You just it's don't just, have the capacity. I don't have, like, my brain doesn't operate that way for some reason. I don't know what it is. Some yeah. people I meet, I, I, get, I get their name, like, immediately. And yeah. it sticks. Others, it's like, I'm sorry, what's your name again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's what Ryan. You gonna do? It's Ryan? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ryan. <laughs> Ryan. 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 Come on, man. Well, what an awesome, <laughs> what an awesome episode, man. Yeah. Big, big love out to the Polish people, our Polish listeners. Yeah, and there's so much more about John Paul oh, that to God. discover. Yeah. And I just, I think we'd all encourage you to just go read more about his life. Fine, because there's, there's a depth to his story and his life that really can't be summarized in just the Cliff Notes version of it. Uh, but some of these are some of the things that give you a little bit more insight into some more personal things of him and things you probably didn't know. But I, I really, I couldn't encourage you enough to go and study this man's life because it is instructive for every human being to, whether you're Catholic, Christian, or agnostic, or not anything, he is a line of humanity and someone that should be modeled. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't had a chance to read Gift and Mystery, it's his autobiography. It's not a long read whatsoever. Uh, it, it's worth it. When did he write that? Oh man, I think that was. Uh, How old was he when he? I think he was. I think he was already pope. I just don't remember. Ninety. Ninety. He was or young. Something. Yeah. He was Here's a bonus 90, fact you didn't know. Yeah. And I'm gonna throw this in there because I'm from Cleveland. Mm -hmm. The first city Pope John Paul II ever went to in the United States was Cleveland. But As pope? No. As Before Pope, okay. as he was, when he was the Bishop of Krakow, we have a very large Polish community. Yeah, well, I went to that church. Yeah, him. I took you there. Oh, wow. There yeah. is a, the, it's St. Stanislaus. Mm -hmm. It's, and as the Bishop of Krakow, he took relics of St. Stanislaus and, and interred them there. Oh, how uh, cool. Yeah. 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 And he went there, he preached at the Ambo there. Uh, they got really a whole cool. little setup over there from yeah, when they he have, came. They have uh, his miter, they have his, some yeah. of his, um, Vestments, very cool. Do you remember how expressive he was in his in his younger years of, yeah. of the, as the Holy Father? Yeah, he's an actor. Oh my gosh! But you know the thing that that, that always does that drive intensity. me crazy, like where people are like, "Well, he was an actor, that's why he was good at what he does." Like, no, he like he expressed. He was good at acting because of who he was. Deep right. passion yeah. inside of himself, yeah. you know, like he expressed himself from that animation of a love for life and a love for humanity that just overflowed and like a bubbling up and just overflowing, being poured out like a libation in a constant manner. That's why I love the fact that he chose the name Paul as well, John yeah. and then Paul and after John Paul the first, but even the, the names themselves and the, and the personages of scripture, you know, like Paul was that witness to the world. He was that evangelist that was out and he was a nomadic priest. Yeah. That's what I love about JP two. He was a nomadic Pope. But then he also had that con con contemplation of John who, who stayed, didn't leave the cross, who stayed with Mary in uh, Ephesus, who was the interior theologian, the, the, the theologian of the, of the apostles. Right. So he had both of those characters. And I think you're right. He really did exhibit the charisms of both John, yeah. St. John, the beloved and St. Paul, the contemplative apostle. in action. And yeah. that's what diocesan priest is supposed to model. Mm -hmm. I see more of a modeling of a nomadic priesthood, returning to the world, returning to the vocation. And hopefully bishops will, will start to see that as well, because I think it's necessary for the health of priests, as well as the health of these different communities that need to be served in diversity. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, John Paul II, pray for us. Amen to that. Yeah. Now, before we go, I want to make sure that everyone, I'm going to remind you again, uh, go to catholictalkshow.com. You can see all the episodes. You can see this episode. You can see every episode that we have ever released. You can um, follow us there. You can subscribe to us on YouTube and iTunes there. You can follow us right from there on all the social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And make sure if you got to, if you, you know, if you enjoy what we're doing, go to patreon.com forward slash the Catholic talk show and consider being one of our patrons. It helps us to continue make these shows. Uh, gives you the opportunity to gain access to some really cool, exclusive uh, content that is not available anywhere else. Uh, gives you the opportunity to get some cool Catholic talk show gear and 
it, it supports us and it means a lot to us that you're you're helping us in this journey and helping us in this ministry. So we really appreciate it if you do. We thank you for being a part of the familia. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, through the intercession of St. John Paul II, may God continue to bless you continue to guide you and give you the courage to not be afraid to open wide the doors of Christ and to live that courageously and boldly in the world. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Live out that totus tuus, baby. 